Well, we continue to go through the book of Ezra, and we arrive at Ezra chapter 8, almost at the end of the book here, taking it in big sections, chapters at a time. So if you would, please turn with me to Ezra chapter 8. Ezra chapter 8. We'll just be reading the first verse from Ezra chapter 8. The word of the Lord says, These are the heads of their fathers' houses, and this is the genealogy of those who went up with me from Babylonia in the reign of Artaxerxes the king. Let's pray. Our gracious God, as we continue through this, this book written by Ezra, the scribe, that man of God, that studier of the word, that doer of the word, that teacher of the word, <clears throat> the strong leader, Lord, that you graced. Help us, Lord, to continue to see what truly makes up the ingredients that foster a, a circumstantial reality of reformation, of revival, of growth, of hope for the future and not despair. Even this morning, we need your presence. We need your spirit. We need you to carry us along, Lord. Build this up, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. amen. <clears throat> so as we continue through this book, I just remind you, remember, this is, again, a handbook. It's a manual for how a true leader and the people under that leadership advance in the face of opposition, how they bring revival, how they bring reformation, how they trust God in the small things. They have a little group that comes out initially. They fight against the opposition in a way that's honoring to the Lord. They don't give in to government tyranny or they realize we've given in. Repent. Let's continue on. They worship. They study. They live. And this morning, we're going to look at another factor of what it would be like if we had Christians who have the ingredients for success in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But before we get there, let's look at the first 14 verses. We won't read them all, but I just read verse 1 for us. What we have here is the second group, 1 through 14, the second group that leaves Babylon and comes back to the promised land. So remember, in the first chapter, we read about the initial group, the initial group that came out, the initial group that heard from Cyrus that the, the, the decree went out that you could return home. And then there was some opposition, and then Darius sends the same request out. And now we have Artaxerxes, again, allowing them to come out. So Ezra and his group, come out. So in your mind, remember, these Jews must have stayed. If the first ones came out, and now we have a second group, we have some people who came out secondly. God always doesn't always work the same in everyone's life. He calls us all to live before Him, to flee from sin, of course, but the way we approach life, some decisions that we make might look different from another Christian. And we'll actually see that tonight later on. But here, just a small, faithful group, a small group that trusts the Lord. They might have heard of what already happened before them. Oh, man, they were facing opposition. What were they going through? Where are they at now? They stopped building for 16 years. Maybe they would have been stirred up. You know how it is when you hear someone else fighting for the kingdom. Oh, I just wish I could be there with them. I should just go with them. And this group comes out with Ezra. And the trip begins in verse 15. Let's read verse 15 through 20. I gathered them to the river that runs to Ahava, and there we camped three days. As I reviewed the people and the priests, I found 
there none of the sons of Levi. Then I sent for Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, Al-Nathan, Jerib, Al-Nathan, Nathan, Zechariah, and Meshulam, leading men, and for Jorib and Al-Nathan, who were men of insight, and sent them to Ido, the leading man at the place of Casaphia, telling them what to say to Ido and his brothers and the temple servants at the place of Casaphia, namely to send us ministers for the house of our God. And by the good hand of our God on us, they brought us a man of discretion, of the sons of Malhi, of Mali, the sons of Levi, son of Israel, namely Sherebiah with his sons and kinsmen, 18, and also Hashabiah and with him Deshahiah and the sons of Merari with his kinsmen and their sons, 20. Besides 220 of the temple servants whom David and his officials had set apart to attend the Levites, these were all mentioned by name. So the trip begins there. They camp out for three nights, so three days by the river there. And they're getting ready. They're getting their resources ready. They're starting to plan. And Ezra, the strong leader that he is, is beginning to organize. And he looks out in the group and he says, where are the Levites? Just a little history on the Levites. These are the men who would be essential to the working of the temple. The priests would be sacrificing. The priests would be doing their daily tasks. The, the, the priests would be, I mean, would be working. But who would pick up the excess blood? Who would clean the temple? Who would get things back in order? The Levites. They were the ministers of the temple, the, the deacons of the temple, if you will. It was, in many ways, hard work. Day after day, sacrifice after sacrifice, cleaning after cleaning. Again, another, more cleaning, more cleaning, more cleaning. Truly a, a work that was, in many ways, could be called menial, trivial, but it was for the temple. So it was honorable. It was God honoring. I'm not too sure that we haven't moved away too far from this. They don't want to come back. Maybe they're thinking, well, in Babylonia, we're not Levites. We own businesses. We're entrepreneurs. We stock, we, we, we're, we're doing what we have to do. We have inventory. We sell it. We're moving about. We travel. I'm a businessman in Babylonia. You want me to go back to Jerusalem to clean blood from the temple again? It makes, you know, we had to be real honest with the humanity of the Bible at times. These Levites probably thought, my life in Babylonia is a little bit more comfortable than what it will be like in Jerusalem. I'm making money out here. I have freedom. I'm creating my own schedule. I'm not waiting tables, as it were. And again, we need men that are willing to do some of this grunt work, some of this gritty work. So these Levites, sure, maybe they didn't at first want to come back, but Ezra sends men out. He sends men that he trusts. He sends men that are of insight, of discretion, meaning there's men in the camp, not just Ezra. You don't just have one leader who's shouldering all the weight. No, he can look out and be like, I trust that guy. He's solid. He's wise. That's what, that's what the church should be like. Not one guy leading the show. It's no, that guy's solid. Man, that guy can carry some weight. You know what? I'll put him in charge of this because I, I, I can trust that guy. Ezra looks out, sees men, says, go and find me Levites back in Babylonia. So they must have come out, right? Envision this in your head. They left Babylonia, they camped out by the river three days, they realized, oh man, no Levites. So they sent some back to Babylonia to find Levites. And they find a good group. We see in 18 that the Lord answered his prayer. The Lord was with them, the hand of God was upon them, and they favored them, and they found laborers. You know, yes, it's a true statement that the laborers are few and the harvest is plentiful. Yes, but there's always laborers. There's always men who rise up. There's always men who are willing to take on the task. And if anything from Ezra, what we see is a male dominant reality that the men, the heads of the homes, the men, the men, the men are leading the way. The men are the ones rising up. The men are the ones putting themselves in harm's way. How badly we need, we need to return to this type of manhood in our culture. Men who are the ones getting their hands dirty with grit and grunts and putting themselves on the line to be biblical men for their families. Biblical men in light of a culture who hates biblical manhood. That's what I see happening here with Ezra and these men. And God provided 258 men to come back home, to leave their comfy little life in Babylon, to leave their, their, their little 
kingdom that they built up to remember the true kingdom that they serve. And you know, as we look out, especially at our church that's growing and our church that is being blessed in many ways and we see all that's ahead, you know, there's a sense where I would love to continue to add ministries to our church, to install women's groups, men's groups, marriage classes, whatever it may be. But ultimately, what we need is God to provide men and women who are bold. Men and women who set aside their little kingdom and say, you know what, I'm going to give myself over to the kingdom of God more. Yes, I'm busy. We're all busy. We all have our things going on. But for the worthy cause of Christ, it's worth leaving some of our comforts behind. Praise God that he raised these men up. Praise God that he answered the prayer. Praise God that Ezra had men he could send back so he could stay with the camp. Praise God that there's faithful people, committed people, people who say, I'm all in. People who say, I'm not just going to flee the first chance I get. People who say, I'm with the Lord and his people. Where I'm at, I'm all there. I'm going to be faithful to Christ. I'm going to give myself over to his kingdom because he is worthy. I praise God that we have faithful people in our church. I praise God that we have people that we can count on in our midst. But we need this across Christianity, not just in our little local assembly. We need this all through evangelicalism. Faithful men and women, not just pastors, not just leaders, but those who make up the congregations, holding fast to their God and, and propagating His truths. Let's read on in verse 21 through 23. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from Him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers or horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king, the hand of our God is, good for, is, is for our good and all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. I love Ezra's honesty here. Look, we fasted. Because I told the king we didn't need anything. We told the king that God was upon us and anyone who was with us would be blessed. Anyone who's against us would be forsaken. So we said, king, we don't need your help. And Ezra's thinking, oh man, maybe I should have requested some help because this 900 mile journey is going to take a long time and there's dangerous people along the way. You know, I seldom would drive to central Mexico. I'll fly there all day. You know, you avoid all that, that middle territory, you avoid the dangerous parts, you fly to where you need to get, and you're with your family. But driving through Mexico, everyone knows you might get pulled over by fake, you know, police, or you might get pulled over by cartel, the police themselves might need to get a, a 20 out of you, they might search your luggage and take some possessions out of you. Driving to Mexico is different, that's kind of what's going on here. They're not just going to get in an airplane and go to Jerusalem and complain that they couldn't sleep on the way there. Right, no, they're actually having to pedal through, walk through dangerous territory. And Ezra thinks, okay, we're not going to ask for help because we told him our God was with us. Interestingly enough, Nehemiah, when he makes this journey, does ask for help. He does say, Lord, can you give us chariots? And he asks the king, and the king grants that, and he praises God for it. So who's wrong? Ezra, who says, no, we'll trust the Lord, or Nehemiah, who says, let's just make this request. This is the beauty of Christianity right here. Two different outcomes, two different conclusions, based on the same exact circumstance, and yet both honor the Lord. Why? Shouldn't one be sinning and the other not, if they made different conclusions? No, because there's something called liberty of conscience. Freedom of conscience. Only Christ is Lord of the conscience. For Ezra to tell Nehemiah, you shouldn't do that, you're not trusting God, you're in sin, that's wrong of Ezra. For Nehemiah to tell Ezra, you're a fool, you should have asked for help. You're in sin for not asking. That would have been not wrong of Nehemiah. In Christianity, we would be wise to realize when there's no sin involved, when there's no one who is crossing the law of God, when there's people who are making free decisions by their own free volition, and it's God honoring either way, we can say, I wouldn't have done that, but praise the Lord that they're honoring their conscience. Praise the Lord that they're trusting their, the spirits leading in their life. We become many tyrants when we start to hold people accountable to our liberty of conscience, to our thoughts, to what we think is best. 
help people. They ask for advice, give them good advice, amen. If you see your brother or sister going down a wrong path where it could lead to sin, speak up. But where there's no sin, that's, that's the, the crux of the matter. Where there's no sin, people are free to make decisions as they, see, please, as they please and as they see fit. So here, Ezra commands a fast. A fast. And fasting is always linked to a humbling of our souls and prayer. I'll show you why in a second. But here we see Ezra commands a fast. He sees the journey ahead. He sees the dangers that lie ahead. He sees the potential of harm. He sees that this could go dangerous. There could be splits in the camp. There could be divisions. Let's fast and truly depend upon God for help. Let's depend upon God for help. You know, in the West, in America, in Christianity in the States, we're so far detached from true danger. Let me give you an example. I was talking on Friday with some coworkers, and they said they could not eat a chicken that they saw killed. Think about that. And I said, you bite into those chickens later on. You literally chew upon their flesh. But if you saw that chicken killed, you couldn't eat it? Yeah, I, I, just, I couldn't stomach it. It'd be too hard for me to see. Or I, I couldn't raise a pig that I would one day slaughter to eat. We're so far detached from reality. You know, 200 years ago, you would know exactly what cow you were going to eat at what point. You would raise animals and you would yourself have to slay them and eat them. Again, there's none of that left in our culture. We're so far detached from real danger. We're so far detached from real victimhood, real victimhood where something like fasting seems foreign to us. Fast? God's sovereign, baby. Why would I fast? Deprive myself of food? Why? God, God's in control. No, but you go to areas, third world countries, areas where there's real danger, areas where they're meeting and they're constantly looking out like a watchman. Is anyone coming to hurt us? Is anyone coming to hurt us? Areas where just this past week, I even read a heart a heart-wrenching email that children were killed in a bomb attack in Burma, in Myanmar. You tell me they're not fasting. We're so far detached from these realities, church, because we take our pride and our comfort. We think, okay, yes, I need to make $300 at the end of the month. Rather than fasting first, we go right to, let's get to work. Let me find a side job, which is good. I'm not, I'm not saying that's bad. That's good. Do your endeavor. Labor. Amen. But first, go before the Lord. First, fast. Whatever it is. In the West, we are so dependent upon physical realities that we have no sense of what true dependence upon the Lord looks like anymore. We don't. I know it sounds like I'm maybe speaking in hyperbole. No, but I'm telling you honestly, we do not depend on God as we ought, dear church. It would be wise for us, as Ezra saw the journey ahead, as Ezra saw what was coming, as Ezra was preparing, he says, we need to fast. We need to humble ourselves and ask the Lord for help. Think about this. Ezra was told to take this group to Jerusalem. Ezra, in a sense, was told, you'll make it there because you're going to teach the law there. Ezra had all the confidence that he would know. If God said I'd make it, I will be there. Yet, he doesn't presume upon grace. He doesn't presume upon God's sovereignty. He doesn't say just because that will happen, I won't take any human endeavors to ensure that I continue to depend upon God. He's not a hyper-Calvinist. He doesn't play upon God's sovereignty and say, well, it just depends on God. It just depends on God. No, he says, I'm going to do all that I can, humanly speaking, humanly speaking, to depend upon God. A daunting task, a strong leader knows. We must go before our king. We must go before our Lord. And he commands a fast. A fast. We'll, we'll talk about this in closure. But let's move on to verse 23 and read that again. So we fasted and implored our God for this. And he listened to our entreaty. He heard the prayers. He heard them. They implored God. And he says, praise God that he heard us. At times it's so hard for us to fathom, honestly, that when we pray, the Creator's hearing. 
that when we're supplicating, our King is hearing us. The maker of heaven and earth is inclining his ear and stooping down to hear our prayers. And he receives them with gladness. Imagine thousands upon thousands of prayers rising up to the king every day. And he's hearing them all. And he's coming through for his people as a covenant faithful God. Think about from Seth on, 6,000, 8,000, 10,000 years, people have been praying to God. And he's been answering prayer after answering prayer after answering prayer. Never once has he failed in his endeavors. And Ezra knows, let's praise God that he heard us. We implored him and he heard us. I pray that we would be a people who express explicitly how utterly dependent we are upon God. Not in princes, not in chariots, not in riches, not in our wisdom, but upon God and God alone for all that we have. You know, what happens in Christianity is sometimes like this. We have a need. We have something that we're worried about. And we say, let's pray about it. And we pray. And then that need gets met. That sin is overcome. And then when you retell the story to yourself, you start saying, well, good thing I did this. Oh, good thing I avoided that. And you begin to look back and start attributing things that you did to help you get to that end. And we fail to say, praise God that he answered our prayers. Praise God that he heard us. Praise God that he is listening to us. Yes, he helped me to do these things. Yes, by his grace, he helped me to put myself in this position where I got this, that, or the other. Yes, he's the one carrying us along. But at the end of the day, God hears our prayers and he's the one answering them. We must display the goodness of God in our lives day in and day out, dear church. When we pray about something, when we seek after God, we must think, yes, Lord, thank you. At the end of the day, it was all you. You know, one thing that I love about our Pentecostal brothers and sisters is they pray for everything. Something's wrong in that day, they stop right then and there and they pray. Let's just stop what we're doing and pray. And I've learned a lot from that. I, I, I love how quick they are to pray before trying to figure things out in their own strength. And me, we as a family, if you know our background, we pick that up. And there's times where some of us are having bad attitudes, and we just think, let's just pray about it. Why continue to fight this in the flesh? Let's just go before the Lord right here and pray about it. I pray that we, in every circumstance, would be living a life that shows in all that we go through, from bad attitudes, from potential job losses, to I don't know where I'm going to live, to whatever it is, stop and pray. And when the Lord meets those needs, thank Him for those realities. From the smallest of things to the biggest of things, we must give our hearts over to a life of prayer and thankfulness when the Lord helps us. Because we need the Lord to help us. We need Him to completely be in control of our lives, and we need to be in a state of dependence before Him. It's interesting. You know, I think most Christians raise their families in what's called a cultural Christianity home, meaning things are just assumed, right? We pray for food and things of that nature. But ask yourselves, when was the last time your children really saw you imploring before the Lord? When was the last time your children heard you begging for their souls before the Lord? When was the last time those around you that know you best saw you truly crying out to God in such a way where those looking around would have been like, man, they are depending on whoever they're talking to, as if it matters, life or death. We must make prayer and dependence upon God and answered prayer a big deal and tell our children, tell those around us, yes, Yes, it, it, it came out okay. Yes, it was successful. Yes, we, we ended up achieving our end. Praise God, He answered our prayers. Look at God. Look at what He does. He loves us. He takes care of us. Make answered prayer a big deal, is all I'm saying, dear church. Make answered prayer in your homes something to explicitly state to your children. The Lord did this. You see this car? The Lord did that. But Dad, I thought you went to work every day. The Lord did that. But, Dad, I thought you went to work 40 hours a week. The Lord did that. 
Well, I thought you were the one saving for a car. The Lord did that. That's the point of the Christian life. The Lord's the one doing it. Using the means, amen, but the Lord's the one sustaining the work. The Lord's the one guiding. The Lord's the one who's holding us. We must go on. Verse 24 through 30. Then I set apart twelve of the leading priests, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and ten of their kinsmen with them. And I weighed out to them the silver and the gold and the vessels and the offering for the house of our God that the king and his counselors and his lords and all Israel there present had, uh, that their present had offered. I weighed out into their hand 650 talents of silver, and silver vessels were 200 talents and 100 talents of gold, 20 bowls of gold worth 1,000 derricks, and two vessels of fine bright bronze as precious as gold. And I said to them, You are holy to the Lord, and the vessels are holy. And the silver and the gold are freewill offerings to the Lord, the God of your fathers. Guard them and keep them until you weigh them before the chief priests and the Levites and the head of fathers' houses in Israel at Jerusalem within the chambers of the house of the Lord. So the priests and the Levites took over the weight of the silver and the gold and the vessels to bring them to Jerusalem, to the house of our God. Again, we see 12 priests. All that's is emulating is this is a continued work of Israel, the 12 priests, the 12 tribes, another mini exodus. And Ezra, again, again, has men to trust with literally about five million, sorry, $500 million worth of vessels. It's so hard for us to comprehend. There's no real sense where we know just how much this was worth, but it's worth in the hundreds of millions, to say the least. And Ezra looks out and says, you could take the gold. You take the silver. When you get there, we'll count it again. You see this. He's, <laughs> it's, in a sense, it's hilarious. Even accounting can be done to the glory of God. Even something as boring as accounting. And I know as an accountant, it's not the most interesting thing. And even here, there's a level of trust. Ezra says, here is all this money. Take it and we'll count it once we get there. Do you know how many scandals in churches have been caused because of mishandling of money? Do you know how many pastors have been removed from the pastor because they couldn't handle money? Money is the root of all evil. It's not evil, it's the root of all evil. And yet Ezra can see men that he trusts enough to say, here's a ton of money. I'm trusting you with it. I'm trusting in really honorable men. Men of integrity, men of valor, honorable men who can be trusted with things that are precious, things that are of value. Again, this is the type of men that we need, men that can be trusted. And did you see something in the text that said, you are holy to the Lord. The holding of money there is saying, you're holy to the Lord. Why? Because the Lord is using you for His end. It doesn't matter what it is. These are just the money holders. Right? So many times we think that only that which is done in high pastoral work or in ministry positions or in spotlight positions, that's what's honorable. That's what's holy before the Lord. That's what really is a blessing to the kingdom of Christ. But no, here Ezra hands money over and says, you're holy before the Lord. Why does he do that? Because he wants these men to know every single task can be holy before the Lord. That's called dignifying work. Something that the Protestant Reformation brought back into reality. Before the Protestant Reformation, the, Catholic, the Roman Catholics used to separate sacred and secular. They would say, if you're a position in the church, a cardinal, a bishop, a priest, or whatever, you're really doing the Lord's work. You guys are really honoring God. But if you're just a farmer, a merchant, or whatever it is, then you're, you're not really honoring God. These are the ones honoring God. You're just working. This is noble. This is not good. This is sacred. This is secular. And yet Ezra here looks at his men and says, you're holy before the Lord. Because he wants them to know, this is done before the eyes of the Lord. So this morning, I'm telling you, men who struggle to get up to a job you don't like. Women who have a hard time in the home trying to see, is this really all that I'm called to do? Men who don't know if their work is worth any value before the eyes of the Lord. I'm telling you this morning, you are holy before the Lord. And if you do your job to His glory and His honor, your work is holy work. Does that, that make you want to work with your hands? 
want to go to work early, be the best employee, because you're not doing it for that wicked boss that you have. You're doing it for the Lord. Does that make you want to take care of your children as tough as they can be at times? Because you're not doing it ultimately for them, not even ultimately for your husband. You're doing it for the Lord. This morning, I'm looking at you guys, I'm telling you, your mundane routine work Monday through Friday is holy work before the Lord, dear church. So be dignified in what you do and live your life for his honor and his glory in all that you do. Verse 35 through the end. At that time, those who had come from captivity, the returned exiles, offered burnt offerings to the God of Israel, 12 bulls for all Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, and a, and a sin offering, 12 male goats. And all this was a burnt offering to the Lord. They also delivered the king's commission to the king's satraps and to the governors of the province beyond the river. And they aided the people and the house of God. So they make it. And what do they do? They first do what they need to do. Sacrifice at the temple. Offer back to God that which is His. They made it. They fasted. God carried them through. And they're praising their God and saying, He heard us. Let's give back to our God. Let's make Him have the first fruits. Let's give to Him the best of our service. And look at the ending there. Don't miss that ending. And they aided the people and the house of God. They got to work. It wasn't just time to sit down and relax and enjoy New Jerusalem there. That's the Christian life, dear church. He calls us out. He calls us by His grace. We respond by faith to His grace. We depend upon God and He carries us through and we praise Him and we offer our lives as a living sacrifice for Him and we get to work and we begin to put our hand to the plow. We begin to trust our leader trusts Christ ultimately, yes, but we put our hand to the plow and we become workers of the kingdom. Offer your first fruits and get to work. So what's the application of all this? I've been sprinkling application this entire sermon, obviously. But there's some things that I really want us to focus on. Focus on. Think about it. Money was needed. Workers were needed. Protection was needed. All that they wanted to accomplish, they needed much they had a daunting task before them. And what's the first thing that they do? They pray. You know, before Christ selected his 12 disciples, what did he do? Went up the mountain to pray. Every single time Christ had a big decision, a big advancement in his ministry, a cross before him, what would he do? He would go to pray. He would go to be with the Lord. He would slip away. We would be wise, dear church, before we make weighty decisions, before we get worried about the future and all that's before us, all the money that's needed, we would be wise to pray, to slip away and, like Ezra says, to fast. You know, again, we are looking for a new building. We're looking for somewhere to possibly buy or rent for a short period of time. California real estate is insane. Rent in California is insane. You have churches that are denominational, so they have tons of money and they own buildings that they're not even using because they're scared, and you try to contact them and say, hey, will you want to sell us your building? No, we're okay. Think about that. Christians who have buildings, not using them. Not using them. And they're not willing to part with them to actually help a church that's meeting and wanting to congregate. So backwards in Christianity in our day. But as I look, and I'm preaching to myself this morning, as I look at California and the tyrants that are before us, as I look at the resources that we need to have anything in this state, as I look at the true difficulty that lies in head and being a Christ-centered, gospel-preaching, biblically-bound church in a state that hates us, I need to be depending upon the Lord. I need to be fasting. The last time I fasted, I think, was with the brother in our church who asked me to fast with him. So I did. That's almost pathetic that it's been that long. I'm not going to ask every single one of you, when's the last time you fasted? That, that, that's not my point this morning. My point is, let's begin to be a people that depend upon our God more explicitly. And when you fast, it isn't, hey, I'm going to let everybody know I'm fasting because I want people to know that I'm fasting. No, just in your own life, we have to realize we need to be constantly depending upon our God. And fasting isn't just don't eat all day. You can fast from social media. You could fast from just breakfast or breakfast and lunch. 
and I only eat dinner for a week. There's so many things you can fast from. Whatever it is, whatever you feel like takes up a lot of your time, or whatever you feel like that, don't fast from work, by the way. Just <laughs> but whatever it is, right, that you feel like, man, I'm giving myself so much of my energies to this, this thing. You know that the Bible even says, fast from intimacy with your spouse if that'll help you pray more. For a season, don't do that if that helps you pray more. That's how serious the word is about taking things out of our life, stripping ourselves of our pleasures, of our comforts, so that we can fast and pray before the Lord and depend upon Him for all things. As I said, in the West, we have so many blessings. We have so much wealth. We have so much things to trust in. But man, what would it be like if we realized that we often take the supernatural out of who God is? We always rely on natural means, carnal means, fleshly means that can be used for His honor. Yes. But because we're so inundated with who we are in the West, we look at our bank accounts, there's money for the future. We look at prospects of moving, prospects of whatever it is. There's things that we can depend upon. And our hearts gravitate to, toward those things. Sometimes I wish that we just would be stripped of it all so that we could truly depend upon God. So that we would see the power of God again. And not forget that He's truly able to accomplish anything that He desires, dear church. What would it be like if we did organize a week-long fast together? Ezra commands the people to fast, not just himself, not just the pastors, not just the leadership. No, you're all going to fast with me. Talk about hangry personalities. Right? What would it be like if we as a group, we as a people said, no, let's fast together. We want something. We want to see our nation change, our state change. We want our city to come to the Lord. We want to, whatever it is, we don't hold fasting over God's head and say, if I'm doing this, you better answer me. No, that's not what fasting is. Fasting is the opposite. We're going to deprive ourselves of stuff so that we could cry out to God more. If you're fasting from food, every time you hunger, pray. Every time that you're feeling your stomach grumble and you're getting angry, pray. It's not a bargaining deal. That's not what we're saying fasting is. No, biblical fasting truly is this, a dependence upon the Lord and the Lord alone for sustenance and what we need. And to be truly mindful of that. When we remove X, cry out to God when you want that. When we fast from this, cry out to God when you're leaning toward that. It's an expression of being dependent upon God more than food, more than physical sustenance, more than comfort or leisure, more than personal dependence upon self, we express we need God. We need God. Dear church, I'm telling you this morning, we in California, we need God. As a church, a small church that preaches biblical manhood, biblical womanhood, biblical views of sex and gender, biblical views of marriage, biblical views of abortion, biblical views of justice, biblical views against race and all that nonsense, as a church that preaches everything that the world is about, we need God. Let's depend upon Him more. Let's truly fast before His throne more. Let's truly see our needs for our children growing up in this state, our needs for the future of the church in our country, and let's pray. Because ultimately, we look to Christ. Christ was the one who did all these things already for us. Christ is the one who prayed for us. Christ is the one who prays for us. Christ is the one who's still mediating for us. Christ is the one that's still on his throne. We see Christ, the trailblazer, trailblazer taking the same method. I need to be before the Lord if I'm going to accomplish his will and his end. To the detriment of Reformed theology, this will be my last point for us who love Reformed theology. There's people who have a wacky theology who literally think that they could bend the hand of God if they just pray enough, if they just fast enough, if they just deprive themselves enough. That's not what we're talking about. But to the sad reality of Reformed theology, we've lost the sight of tearing before the Lord. We lost the reality of begging before the Lord until He hears us, of being like Jacob and wrestling with the Lord and not letting Him go until He blesses us because we bought into just a false view of what sovereignty is, dear church. No, we can't twist God's arm. We can't beg 
him to do something he's, he's not willed to do. We get those things. But we who have a firm understanding of who God is, may we truly see the omnipotence and the authority and the lordship that he has and realize that Christ's blood purchased this access for us to be before his throne and see whatever lies before us, whatever is ahead, whatever need we have, we depend upon the Lord in a real powerful way, fasting and praying as a form of communion with him, that we would truly hunger for God to bless us. Will we, will we be known as a praying church? 30 years from now, 50 years from now, Will people look back and say, well, that church took a stand? Not because they were strong, but because they depended upon the Lord. Let's be a church who truly depends upon our God, dear church. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we praise you that you hear us even now. Even these words that I'm saying, you are hearing them. What a mind-blowing thought, dear God. Ezra, with the monumental task before him, sets out his people to pray and to fast and to humble themselves before your throne. May we be a people who humble ourselves. May we be a people who fast. May we be a people who truly depend upon you for all that's ahead. In Christ's name, amen.